Okay, hi everyone. Um, good morning um, to everyone joining the Fight CRC webinar. Thanks for hopping on today. My name is Sharon Worrell. I'm the Senior Manager of Education here at Fight CRC. Um, and thanks for being here. So today we're going to talk about the impact of biomarker testing for colorectal cancer. We also have a quick COVID-19 update for you as well. So for our webinars, uh, please feel free to ask a question in the panel on the right side of your screen at any point uh, during the duration of, of the presentation, and we will address your questions at the end of the, of the session. As always, our webinars are being recorded. Uh, you can watch them on the Fight CRC website a few hours after the recording, and you'll also be emailed a direct link um, to the webinar tomorrow morning. So you can visit fightcrc.org um, later today or any time in the future to watch the recording of this webinar. And if you have Twitter, please follow along. Uh, use the hashtag CRCWebinar and join our discussion there. Fight CRC offers a wide variety of resources for those touched by colorectal cancer. Again, visit our website to view, download, and order the latest resources. Um, we have launched a new program called Wellness Wednesday, and you can join us at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on Facebook. This week, we'll be joined uh, by Ann Ogden Gaffney from Cook for Your Life, and she's going to do a little food demo for us. Um, you can also check out our website to see our updated blogs around COVID-19. We have one uh, from last week around colorectal cancer and clinical trials. And of course, um, we have Your Guide in the Fight, which is our, our resource for stage three and stage four colorectal cancer patients. The information and services provided by Fight CRC are for general informational purposes only. The information and services are not intended to be substitutes for professional medical advice, diagnoses, or treatment. If you are ill or suspect that you are ill, please see a doctor immediately. And in, a, in an emergency, please call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room. Fight CRC never recommends or endorses any specific physicians, products, or treatments for any condition. And with that said, today we're super excited to have uh, Dr. Chris Liu joining us. Dr. Liu joined the University of Colorado School of Medicine faculty in July 2011. He trained in internal medicine at the University of Colorado, where he also served as a chief medical resident. He completed his fellowship training in medical oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center and served as the chief medical oncology fellow in 2010. He currently serves as the Director of GI Medical Oncology at the University of Colorado Cancer Center, the Vice Chair of the National Cancer Institute Colon T Cancer Task Force, and he serves on the National Comprehensive Cancer, Center, Cancer Network Panel for Neuroendocrine Cancers. Um, a bit about his research endeavors also um, on this slide. Um, Dr. Liu, thank you so much for being with us today, and I'm going to let you take it from here. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to Fight CRC uh, for allowing me to present on biomarkers. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here. And uh, all right. And, uh, and we'll get going. Uh, so yeah, thank you again to Fight CRC for allowing me uh, to talk uh, about biomarker testing. And it seems like we can't get through any medical talk uh, without at least talking a little bit about COVID. So we'll do that as well. Uh, but I hope that uh, this information uh, you'll find useful uh, just to kind of uh, find out more about colorectal cancer and, and how really the biomarkers uh, that we're testing for now may uh, impact treatment. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, I will not be talking about any off-label uh, use of any drugs or products. All right, so what are we going to talk about over the next 40 minutes? Uh, so I, I know that we're talking to a very sophisticated uh, group of people uh, on this call, but we'll, we'll kind of start with the basics and just talk about, well, when people talk about biomarker testing, uh, what are we exactly are we talking about and how might that impact uh, the treatment or the surveillance uh, for my cancer? Uh, we'll talk about some uh, meaningful biomarkers for colorectal cancer and how this field has really changed, particularly over the last decade. Uh, we're going to touch briefly on circulating tumor DNA. So people talk about ctDNA. We're going to talk about what that is and how that might impact cancer treatment and surveillance in the future. And then again, a quick COVID-19 uh, update. So we are going to go through a lot of information over the next uh, 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think these slides will be made available and a recording will be made available uh, online uh, that you can go back to for reference if needed. 
All right. So, you know, personalized medicine is a big buzzword, not only in cancer, but just in medicine in general. Uh, and, and really all we're talking about is individualizing a medical treatment plan uh, specific to a patient. Uh, you know, if we take 100 patients with any disease, we'll, take, we'll have 100 people that have very, very different uh, you know, bodies, uh, different environmental exposures, even different diseases. Uh, and so how can we better get away from a one-size-fits-all treatment uh, to a treatment that can really be directed at a, at a patient's, um, uh, patient's disease? And so really what we're trying to do is identify the treatments that are more likely to benefit somebody uh, and, and maybe even uh, help them avoid certain side effects of therapies. So whenever we talk about cancer treatment, we talk about treatment with surgery or radiotherapy or chemotherapy or targeted therapy. And so most of what I'm going to talk about is about chemotherapy and targeted therapy uh, as a medical oncologist. But certainly, we want to individualize treatment plans for patients undergoing surgery or radiotherapy as well. So if you kind of think generally about what chemotherapy is, you know, chemotherapy is really any type of treatment that works by killing rapidly dividing cells. And the reason why this works is because, well, we know that cancer cells divide more rapidly than some of the more normal tissues in our body, but it's kind of like dropping a, 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 an unguided bomb onto a cancer. So maybe you hit your target, but you certainly have a lot of collateral damage. And, and that's why when we give these treatments, there are a lot of side effects that we really don't want to give our patients. When we talk a little bit more about target therapy and immunotherapy, these are treatments that really work by targeting specific genes or proteins that are altered in cancer cells. And so we, we like to think of these as, you know, better bombs or smart bombs. And the idea is that maybe you hit your target and you don't have that same collateral damage that you have with chemotherapy. And so a lot of times these treatments can be used either alone or in combination with chemotherapy, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely without side effects. We're just hopeful that the off-target effects are minimized. Therefore, we're really getting a lot of cancer cell kill or inhibition and hopefully leaving normal uh, tissues intact. You know, it's amazing when you think about the treatment of metastatic colorectal cancer because really the first FDA-approved drug for metastatic colorectal cancer is seen on this slide, which is uh, the number one drug is 5-fluorouracil. And this uh, drug was, was uh, essentially kind of created and, and, and was under study in 1957. And so for the next 40 years, there is literally just one FDA-approved agent to treat metastatic colorectal cancer. When you look at this list now, you see that there's 16 FDA-approved drugs to treat metastatic colorectal cancer. These includes a, include a certain number of chemotherapy drugs, like the cytotoxics that you see at the top of this slide. But this also includes biologic and targeted, and in, in, in rare cases, the use of immunotherapy to treat colorectal cancer. And what's neat about this is that, well, this slide I actually had to update today because just you know one or two weeks ago, the last one on this list, encarafenib, was recently uh, approved in combination with cetuximab uh, to treat uh, BRAF B600E mutated colorectal cancer. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. So this is a list that has expanded greatly over the last 15 to 20 years. And, and certainly we want this list to expand even greater because uh, we want uh, better uh, and more effective therapy options for our patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer. We also know that colorectal cancer is expensive, and I just kind of put this slide down just to kind of get an idea that when you're talking about old drugs, old chemotherapy drugs like 5-fluorouracil, that can be relatively cheap. But when we talk about some of these newer agents, the prices are really astronomical. And this is just something that we always need to keep in mind when we're developing new drugs. And it's not that there's a certain price point that's correct for any one of these drugs, but if we're going to be spending this much money on any particular drug to treat our patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer, we want to make sure that we're not incrementally improving our patients' progression-free survival or overall survival. We want these big jumps, and so we want a big kind of bang for our buck. And, and so that's something to kind of keep in mind as we're developing these drugs is that we don't want these kind of small incremental benefits, although those are obviously important but we really want kind of bigger uh, effects of these drugs uh, to provide the maximum amount of benefit to our patients. So I alluded to this before, but you know, really this idea of cancer treatment for, for many, many decades was really just a one size fits all. You're diagnosed with a particular cancer, we're gonna give treatment, and it's gonna be the same treatment, even though if we take 100 patients diagnosed with metastatic colorectal cancer, they're all very different. Their tumors are also very different with different mutational profiles. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we give everybody a one-size-fits-all treatment that maybe somebody has a really great response, 
but then other patients have no response at all because we're definitely dealing, even though we're dealing with just colorectal cancer, we're still dealing with very, very different diseases, even within the idea of having you know, a single disease such as colorectal cancer. So how do we get to this idea of individualizing treatment or personalizing therapy uh, for our patients? Well, we use biomarkers. And biomarkers is just a short term for a biological marker that can be found in, uh, in, in your blood, in any body fluids or tissues. And a lot of times the biomarker testing actually comes from the tumor itself. And so that's why these biopsies are always very, very important. But once the biomarker testing is done, the results of those tests may tell you whether or not the cell is normal or not normal. It may tell you how aggressive a cancer is. Sometimes we can look at tumor tissue and say, oh, wow, this, you know, this tumor is going to act more aggressively than others, and I'm going to give you a great example of that. We're going to, we, we can potentially predict the likelihood of a cancer's response to a specific treatment plan. I'll give you plenty of examples of that, and it'll help you and your doctor make decisions about care. And one of the you know, kind of most classic you know, biomarkers that we even test for uh, that uh, many people on the call have had is just CEA, which is a blood test, uh, which can tell us sometimes uh, if it's elevated or not, or going up or going down, if we're actually having a response to treatment or not. What is the difference between biomarker testing and genetic testing? I want to make this very, very clear. So if you think about biomarkers, uh, you know, abnormalities or rearrangements or mutations that are found in cancer cells that are different than normal cells, we're really talking about this idea of biomarker testing. So biomarker testing, when I refer to it, is really going to be largely talking about the tumor itself. And that's different than genetic testing. And a lot of times genetic testing is performed by either getting a blood draw or uh, taking a saliva specimen. And genetic testing is the genetic sequence of DNA that we're born with. And so this is, these are the genes that we inherit from our parents. And I wanna make sure that that's a very clear distinction between biomarker testing for the tumor, which has its own mutational profile, versus genetic testing, which are the genes that you've inherited from your parents. And so those are two types of testing that we certainly perform in patients, but they give us two very, very different types of information. And when we talk about biomarker testing, if we talk about somebody being biomarker negative, it means that there's usually no mutation in the gene that we're testing for. And so if you ever hear about uh, somebody talking about a gene and that gene is wild type, that means that there's no mutation in that gene, which means it's a biomarker negative. If you talk about biomarker positive, it usually means that a gene is mutated. And so we talk about this as, well, there's a mutation in this gene, so the biomarker is then positive. So I'm gonna talk about one of the earliest biomarkers that we use for colorectal cancer to, uh, to help identify a treatment plan that may or may not be appropriate for patients. And so I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because I think a lot of people on the call certainly uh, know uh, a lot about KRAS mutations uh, as uh, the data for KRAS mutations is now about 12 years old. But we have two targeted drugs that are FDA approved, cetuximab and panitumumab, and they target a receptor called the epidermal growth factor receptor. And there's that antibody kind of in red at the very top of this figure, really attaching itself to this receptor. And the idea is that if you can shut this off up here on the outside part of a cell, you can stop all this downstream signaling. So what are the things that we want to stop? Well, we, don't, we want to stop cell survival in the tumor. We want to stop metastasis. We want to stop growth. And so the idea is that if you just plop an antibody on top of this receptor, you're going to shut down this what we call intracellular signaling or signaling that goes on inside the cell to do the things that we don't want tumor cells to do. But the idea was that, well, we know that there's a cascade of signaling that occurs, and you're seeing that on the screen right now. So if there's a RAS mutation, which lies downstream of this antibody and the receptor. So if you shut off the water at the top of this figure, but the water is turned on by a mutation downstream of it, the tub is still going to fill up, right? So you can shut off all the water you can up top, but if there's continued signaling because there's a mutation in this gene called RAS, the problem is that the signaling may continue even though you've effectively hit your target upstream. And so this is what we saw. So this is a group of patients that were treated with this drug cetuximab that targets epidermal growth factor receptor. And we found out that if the patient did not have a mutation in the gene called RAS, they received all the benefit but if the patients had a mutated KRAS gene, then they received no more benefit than receiving just best supportive care alone. And this is why we test for this particular mutation is because if 
our patients have a RAS mutation, it predicts that our patients are not going to benefit from an EGFR inhibitor, cetuximab or panituumab. And this represents about 50 to 55 percent of our patient population. Now, it's what we call a negative predictive biomarker, which means that well, if we give this drug and they have the mutation, they're not going to very, they're not going to benefit. But why is this important? It means that we're not wasting our patients' time with an ineffective drug, and it means that we're not giving them side effects of a drug that's unlikely to help them. So this is a very, very important biomarker. And the era of biomarker testing for colorectal cancer really did begin in 2008 uh, when these studies came out. All right, what about biomarkers beyond KRAS and NRAS? And so what about uh, BRAF V600E mutations? And so we had talked about earlier this idea that biomarkers can sometimes tell you how aggressive a cancer is. And so um, on this slide right here, you can see that the BRAF gene, the RAF gene, and this red arrow is pointing to it, lies directly downstream of RAS. And so this idea, well, maybe a mutation here might also cause resistance to these drugs, cetuximab and panitumumab. What we found out is that the BRAF V600E mutation suggests that the tumor is going to behave very aggressively. So we don't necessarily know whether or not it's a negative uh, predictor for benefit from cetuximab or panitumumab. What we can tell you is that those patients with this type of mutation are very unlikely to benefit from a lot of the therapies that we give. It does suggest that the tumor is very aggressive. Now, I'm gonna actually switch gears to a different disease because this era of modern kind of personalized medicine was also highlighted in skin cancer. So this exact same mutation that we see in colorectal cancer is the same mutation that we see in skin cancer, and that's a BRAF V600E mutation. The V600E just shows you what the uh, mutation is and where it's located. What was interesting is that in 2009, 2010, there was a drug that was under study that could actually target the specific gene. And so it was a drug called vemurafenib. It targeted BRAF. And so this idea is that if you have a mutation in the gene BRAF and you have a drug that can target that specific mutation, maybe you could get a lot of benefit. And this is what we saw with BRAF mutated melanoma. So what you're seeing is a PET scan on your left showing a lot of dark spots, which represents a lot of cancer. And you can see after six weeks of therapy, how different the PET scan looked by targeting the gene that was mutated with a drug that could target that specific spot. This is what it looked like on the patient. You can see a lot of tumors on the patient's chest wall here. And after six weeks, you can see a significant improvement uh, of this treatment. Now, we know that over time, there's a resistance that builds up in melanoma. And so that's why uh, kind of the, the idea of uh, clinical research was important here because what they do now is actually give a co uh, combined targeted uh, treatment to uh, treat melanoma. But this idea was that, well, if this works so well in melanoma, could it work just as well in colorectal cancer? And so we tried the exact same drug with the exact same mutation in our patients with BRAF mutated colorectal cancer, and the results were very, very different than what we saw in melanoma. Instead of this like 60% or 70% response rate to this drug, we only had a 5% response rate. And so it tells you that even though we have the same mutation in a different disease, the resistance mechanisms are very, very different. And so people always kind of wonder, you know, why is research so important? Uh, and this was a great example of how a research done in the laboratory really informed us in terms of what we should be doing clinically. So what we found out and what this slide is showing you is that when we inhibit the BRAF gene in BRAF mutated colorectal cancer, there's a feedback loop, and that's that dotted line that you're seeing on the figure on your right that feeds back through EGFR and reactivates that signaling. And so this idea that if you knock out BRAF, you're actually creating a feedback loop, which then activates a lot of other pathways. And so one of the strategies from this, uh, from this research really came uh, into a clinical trial where instead of inhibiting just BRAF, you actually gave targeted therapy where you inhibited BRAF, and you see that denoted by these diagonal red lines. You're inhibiting MEK with a MEK inhibitor, which lies downstream of BRAF, and you're targeting EGFR with cetuximab, one of the FDA-approved drugs. And what we found was that the results of this triple-targeted combination therapy actually resulted in much, much better outcomes 
for patients with BRAF mutated colorectal cancer. So this was a, a strategy that actually worked and that appeared to improve our patients' overall survival and progression-free survival. So one of the big take-home points, and this was just FDA approved just a couple of weeks ago, is that BRAF B600E mutated colorectal cancer suggests that it's a very, very aggressive cancer, but now there's an FDA-approved combination of encorafenib and cetuximab for these patients. And now, and what you're seeing on, the, on, the, uh, on your right are the NCCN guidelines for colon cancer showing that you know, encorafenib and cetuximab now show up on the, uh, uh, on the approved guidelines. It is FDA approved. And this is about 5 to 10% of our patient population. So it's not a huge amount of our patient population, but it's critical because if we find that 5 to 10% of our patient population, we can give them a targeted therapy combination that we know will likely benefit them. All right, so one of the things that we wanted to address uh, on this call was targeting NTRAC fusions. And so uh, this is another biomarker um, that uh, is now FDA approved, not just for colorectal cancer, but actually for all cancers. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what a gene fusion is. And it, it's basically as simple as it sounds. So when, there's a, when there are two genes, you can actually have a break off of both genes and you can create a gene fusion where you take a kind of a combination of gene one and gene two. And this happens in numerous genes, but one of them is the TRK uh, gene. So this is a TRK fusion protein. That's the figure that you see on your top right. On the bottom right, you can see that when there's a gene fusion, it activates a lot of the pathways that tumors use to grow, which means it is what we call a driver alteration or a driver fusion. And so the thought is, well, if we know that this is driving the cancer, what if we were able to target this gene fusion with a drug that was perfectly suited to kind of inhibit this? And so the idea is that if you inhibit the TREC fusion protein, you could get then inhibit all this downstream signaling that the tumors use to grow. So this is a very rare mutation in colorectal cancer. And so what we're showing you here is the pivotal New England Journal of Medicine paper looking at this drug called larotrectinib, which targets this gene fusion called TRK or TREC. It's rare in metastatic colorectal cancer. It represents about 1% or less of all patients, which means you might find it in one out of every 100 patients that you test. So it's very, very rare. But what they saw in not just colon cancer, but in all these other tumors, was that there is an 80% response rate. So eight out of every 10 patients had a significant shrinkage of their tumors. And then 16% of these patients had a complete response rate. What I'm showing you here is a waterfall plot, which represents the greatest change in tumor volume uh, after starting treatment. And so the red arrows denote the patients that had colorectal cancer. And so you can see, again, there are not a ton of patients here, but you can see that there's a significant amount of shrinkage in the patients that had colorectal cancer with this NTREC uh, fusion protein. Uh, and so again, you have to look for it, you have to test it, but if you find it, it can have a pretty significant benefit. We're not only just worried about the shrinkage of a cancer, but almost more importantly, we want to make sure that when patients derive benefit from a drug, that those responses are durable. And this is the key word. It's not just that you want a great shrinkage of the tumor, but you want that to go on for a very, very long time. And what you're seeing in what they call swimmer's plots here, and so you're seeing uh, the res how long a patient was experiencing that durable kind of uh, massive shrinkage of the cancer. And you can see here that this is, you know, this, uh, the X line of this graph is measured in months. And so we know that sometimes chemotherapy will work great for a couple of months, but then it'll start to lose its effectiveness. Here, what you're seeing is that a lot of these respons responses are very, very durable where patients are receiving benefit from this drug, not for months, but actually for years. And so this also appears now uh, on the NCCN guidelines for the treatment of metastatic colon cancer or colorectal cancer. Larotrectinib is a treatment option for patients with metastatic colorectal cancer that is NTREC gene fusion positive. And the only way you're ever going to know if uh, a tumor has this gene fusion protein or any mutation in any of these genes that we're talking about is to send that tissue off for testing uh, or sometimes even getting a liquid biopsy, which we're going to cover in just a little bit. 
Uh, a lot of people on this call are very aware of this idea of um, immunotherapy and the impact that it's had on multiple cancers. I'm going to talk about a very small subset of our patient population that has metastatic colorectal cancer uh, that's called MSI high, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But one of the hallmarks of cancer is that it evades your immune system. Your immune system should be able to recognize cancer cells, should be able to kill it. But, you know, cancers are very smart in a way that they are able to evade immune destruction. So I'm going to talk about microsatellite instability high colorectal cancer or MSI high colorectal cancer. And so really, you know, what does that mean? And so everybody on this call and everybody in the world at every single kind of moment of the day are replicating DNA. But when you replicate you know, so many millions and millions of strands of DNA, you're going to have typos. You're going to have what we call mismatches. And so what I'd like to tell, you know, kind of liken it to is that if I asked everybody on this call to transcribe War and Peace on Microsoft Word and to do it with an intact spell checker, you'd probably have a handful of typos, but maybe not a lot. But if I asked you to transcribe War and Peace on Microsoft Word without uh, uh, an intact spell checker, you'd probably have a gajillion typos uh, in, in your manuscript. And, and, and this is uh, the key here is that in order for our bodies to be able to recognize these typos that happen in DNA replication, it has to be able to recognize it. And what you're seeing here is essentially an unwinding of the DNA, replacing the typo, and then winding the, the, the DNA back up. And this is what our bodies do every day. And it prevents us from having uh, too many typos or mutations uh, when we replicate our DNA inside of our bodies. If you have a defect in the spell checker for your DNA, we call this defective mismatch repair, then you start accumulating these typos because your body's not recognizing these typos and you're just accumulating more and more mutations. And so we know that a typical colorectal cancer has somewhere between 30 and 70 mutations in any colorectal cancer that we normally treat. If you have deficient mismatch repair, another term for that is microsatellite instability high or MSI high colorectal cancer, you don't have 30 to 50 mutations in your tumor. You actually have closer to 1,500 to 1,700 mutations. And why that's important is because when you have that many mutations in a tumor cell, your body starts to recognize that something really bizarre is going on. And so what I'm showing you here is a slide of an MSI high colorectal cancer and all these dark spots that you see, particularly in panel B, are all these lymphocytes, these T cells, which can help kill the cancer. And they're actually inside of the cancer, but they've just been turned off. And so the, a lot of the research in, in many cancers, including colorectal cancer, has been kind of centered around turning these T cells on and getting them to kill the cancer. And so there's a drug that can do that, uh, pembrolizumab. The trade name for this drug is called Keytruda, which you've probably seen plenty of commercials for. It's essentially just an antibody. And all the antibody does is block a ligand called program death ligand receptor 1, or PD-1. And the idea is that when there's a ligand and a receptor, that, and the tumor cell expresses the receptor, the T cell has this PD-1 ligand, when that connection is made, it turns off tumor killing. But if you develop an antibody that can bind this up and therefore break the connection between the tumor cell and the T cell, now tumor killing is on and the T cell is turned on to kill the cancer that it was supposed to in the first place. And so what you see here with all the green lines are all the patients with MSI high colorectal cancer treated with pembrolizumab. Uh, and you can see that not only is there a significant amount of shrinkage, which is the negative part of this y-axis, you can see that a lot of these responsibles, uh, re responses are durable. And you can see that because they're, they're having these responses to this drug, but it's lasting, again, not for months, but actually for years. What we also know is that this drug does not work for the 95% of patients that do not have this deficiency in their spell checker that are not MSI high. And that's denoted by all of the red lines. You can see very quickly that patients' tumors are growing and they're growing fairly fast. And so, uh, we also know that combination immunotherapy works very well uh, for these patients, and so this is another study of two combination immunotherapy drugs, nivolumab and ipilimumab, and you can see that a majority of these patients have had a very, very significant response uh, to combination immunotherapy. Pembrolizumab was the first ever drug to be approved that wasn't approved solely on the basis of uh, the site. So we get drugs that are approved for breast cancer, drugs that are approved for colorectal cancer. Here, 
this drug is approved for all cancers if you're MSI high. Uh, the NTRAC inhibitor, larotrectinib, is also a tissue agnostic uh, FDA approval. Uh, so it's just one of those things where if you find a biomarker, you can give them uh, these drugs. Uh, so the take-home point, MSI high colorectal cancer does predict for benefit from immunotherapy. Unfortunately, it's only about 4% of our patient population with metastatic colorectal cancer. So, so much research is going into trying to figure out uh, you know, how to make immunotherapy effective for the other 96% of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. I'll also tell you that in about two months or a month and a half, we should get additional data uh, on using immunotherapy in the frontline setting for patients with MSI high colorectal cancer. Merck came out with a press release saying that the tissue or, or that the study met its primary endpoint of progression-free survival. So you're going to see headlines coming out suggesting for this very small but very, very meaningful patient population, we maybe should be uh, starting with immunotherapy and not giving them chemotherapy to start with in the first place. So this is a snapshot of molecularly directed therapy for colorectal cancer just 10 years ago. Uh, and this is what the landscape looked like. We knew about KRAS, we didn't know about anything else. And so this is kind of like an undefined, unknown uh, kind of area for most of our patients. This is what it looks like for 2020. And, and this pie chart obviously looks a lot, lot better than the one that we saw in 2010. And so it does show you the progress that's been made in, in this disease. I will tell you that you know, we need a, a lot more. Also. You know, in this presentation, I've talked about, you know, 4% here, 3% here, even 1% or less for NTRAC mutations. But the more we're able to kind of cut away at this pie, even if it's 1% at a time, it means that this idea of undefined or not knowing any biomarkers for colorectal cancer, it's going to continue to get smaller. And so, you know, obviously over the next, you know, couple of years, we want to see even more of this pie filled up uh, with actionable mutations. So biomarkers may direct cancer treatment. Uh, every patient's mutational makeup is unique. Uh, knowing a tumor's biomarker can help uh, select the most effective and appropriate treatment plan. And really, this is just, you know, this entire presentation kind of boils down to this. You know, talk with your doctor about biomarker testing. Uh, if you want to ask uh, these particular questions, these are great questions to ask. Has my tumor been tested for biomarkers? And if it has, how will the biomarker status affect my treatment plan? That's two very, very easy questions to ask your doctor. Uh, we expect you to ask these questions. Uh, hopefully your doctors are bringing this up on their own, but even if they're not, go ahead and, and, and ask them because chances are your, your doctor has tested your tumor for biomarkers, which is informing their treatment plan. Uh, we want this to be shared decision-making between the patient and their provider. Uh, and if all else fails, it'll be just a great reminder uh, for your care team to make sure that they're doing everything they can to get as much genetic information about the tumor uh, as possible. All right, uh, we're gonna wrap up uh, with two things. We're gonna talk a little bit about ctDNA, uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about COVID-19. So uh, hang with me uh, for the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So when we talk about liquid biopsies or circulating tumor DNA, what exactly are we talking about? And so the tumor really does release a decent amount of things into the bloodstream. Uh, that, that we've known about for a, a while, but now we're starting to be able to utilize this information. So a tumor can release circulating tumor cells, which sometimes we can actually capture with a blood draw. It, we also know that when tumor cells die, they sometimes release something called cell-free DNA or circulating tumor DNA. And this, these are kind of small fragments of DNA that are released into the bloodstream, which we can sometimes capture in peripheral blood and then actually sequence it sequence those fragments of DNA to look for mutations. So this is a really nice slide from Rick Landman uh, from Garden360. And so this is kind of just to show you that not all DNA that you capture in your bloodstream is actually tumor DNA. In fact, a vast majority of the cell-free DNA that exists in your uh, bloodstream is not circulating tumor DNA. It's just your normal DNA. But we know that in patients that have cancer, we can a lot of times detect a certain amount of tumor DNA that's literally just kind of circulating in your bloodstream. And your body metabolizes this fairly quickly, uh, within minutes actually. Uh, but here, if you can capture the circulating tumor DNA, you can actually then uh, look for mutations uh, in that DNA and actually molecularly profile a patient's tumor without sticking a needle really into anything other than just getting a blood draw. 
Uh, we're ta we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the clinical application in terms of looking for disease that we can't see. And so the localized disease part of this figure we're going to talk about in just a little bit. For this, uh, th for the purpose of this slide, I want to focus a little bit more on the metastatic disease site. And so you can imagine that uh, what you're looking at here is a colon and a liver and the red dots are there to signify cancer. And you might imagine that if you start somebody on a therapy uh, in the second panel, you can see that these tumors have shrunk down and that's exactly what we're looking for. And so one of the advantages of being able to draw a blood sample and look for how much circulating tumor DNA is that on the bottom uh, part of this figure, you can see that when you started treatment, there's radiologic shrinkage of this tumor, but the CT DNA has dropped down, which means that you can even quantify how much tumor DNA exists in the bloodstream. And you can see that if there's a lot of cancer, maybe there's a lot of circulating tumor DNA. If you're being effective at killing cancer, maybe you have a sharp drop in your circulating tumor DNA, which means that you might be able to monitor the response of a cancer even before you get a CT scan. At the time of disease progression, sometimes we notice that one tumor continues to stay small, but there are a couple tumors that are growing. The power of circulating tumor DNA is that you might be able to identify why a patient is no longer responding to the treatment that we're giving them. And if you can use that information, maybe we're seeing different mutations, maybe we're seeing different resistance mechanisms, we may be able to alter therapy in order to better treat uh, somebody's cancer. I would say that this is all very experimental at this time, but this really kind of shows you what the power of a liquid biopsy is. What about for monitoring patients with residual disease? And so what I'm showing you here is uh, kind of a graph of long-term survival for stage three colon cancer. So we still know that a majority of our patients with stage three colon cancer are gonna not, never have disease recurrence, and that's because of surgery, uh, that's because of chemotherapy. But we also know that it's a one-size-fits-all treatment for patients with stage three colon cancer. You're diagnosed with stage three colorectal cancer, you're gonna get chemotherapy. Maybe in some cases with rectal cancer, you're gonna get radiation therapy but it's still a one-size-fits-all. So if we treat 10 patients with stage three colorectal cancer, uh, about five who are treated never needed the chemotherapy anyway because they were cured with surgery. Uh, there are two or three patients that we treated, but they're gonna relapse anyway, so our treatment was gonna be ineffective, which means that out of 10 patients that we treat with stage three colorectal cancer, we're treating 10 patients to really save or prevent recurrence of only about two or three patients. and so. Can circulating tumor DNA or liquid biopsies help us to better answer that question? And the data is still very, very early. So this is still a very, very new field, tons of clinical research with very, very limited data. But what you're seeing here is that if a patient is CT DNA negative in this particular study that was presented by Max Dean at ASCO in 2017, if you're CT DNA negative, that is denoted by the blue lines, you're very, very unlikely to have a recurrence of your cancer. If you're CT DNA positive following surgery, you're very, very likely to experience a recurrence. So maybe, uh, and this is just a maybe right now because there's so many questions that we need to answer before we put this into true clinical practice, but maybe this blue line are the patients that we shouldn't be treating with chemotherapy. And maybe this orange line here are the patients that not only we should be treating, but maybe we should be finding something more effective for them to prevent their cancer from coming back. And so, again, a very early field. Uh, I would say in some cases, circulating tumor DNA is ready for prime time. I would say in terms of identifying actionable alterations like BRAF mutations uh, or HER2 amplifications, this really is ready for prime time. And so uh, a lot of times, uh, especially if we can't get tissue testing done, uh, we'll actually send our uh, blood samples uh, from our patients off for, uh, to look for mutations. So I would say that this is definitely ready for prime time. In terms of predicting treatment response, I would say that's not necessarily ready for prime time, but definitely possibly in the future, the power of circulating tumor DNA will definitely change the landscape uh, of the way we treat metastatic colorectal cancer. In terms of monitoring therapeutic resistance, I would say potentially clinical trials are ongoing. And in terms of the, det the detection of minimal residual disease, and what we mean by that is uh, the detecting of cancer that exists in the body that is not visible by CT scan, I would say there's a high potential for this as well, and clinical trials are ongoing as well. All right, uh, we'll wrap up with a quick update on COVID-19. Uh, I don't mean to inundate you uh, with uh, a lot more information on COVID because it's just splattered all across the news, but I think it's probably worth um, 
uh, discussing uh, just because this is uh, definitely what's going on uh, right now uh, and impacting uh, the care for our patients as well. Uh, this is uh, data that's updated uh, as of this morning. There are 2.4 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, which is just a staggering number, uh, 166,000 deaths. Uh, and on the bottom right-hand corner of this, you can see the increased uh, number of cases really spanning from January all the way to where we are today. In terms of the United States, uh, we have uh, 761,000 cases uh, of COVID-19, uh, unfortunately 35,000 deaths. Uh, and you can kind of see this rapid rise from March to April of the amount of cases that we have. And you can kind of see from this map that obviously uh, there's a, a much, much higher incidence uh, uh, of COVID-19 in these uh, urban areas, um, but still affecting really uh, pretty much every single state uh, in the United States. Now, we always talk about flattening the curve, uh, and I want to be able to show this data as well. So uh, the green line here that you see, which is at the very top of this figure, is the United States. If you ever wondered what flattening the curve actually looked at looked like, in reality, this is what it looks like. So you can kind of see from March 15th to April, uh, early April, this dramatic rise uh, in confirmed new cases of COVID-19. But really, from early April to where we are today, uh, I think we've been very successful in terms of flattening the curve. And I think that uh, us, along with other countries, uh, have really seen a, a significant flattening of the curve. What you really never wanted to see in this situation was a curve that continued to go up exponentially. That's when you put healthcare providers in a position where they may have limited resources, limited ICU beds, limited ventilators, and you really don't want to put hospitals in the situation of having to choose who may or may not get a ventilator like we were seeing uh, sometimes in northern Italy. And I think, obviously, uh, places like New York um, have been harder hit than others, um, but I think for the most part, uh, the capacity of the medical system has really kept up with the demand and the need. Uh, we just obviously don't want to see this uh, go up any further. So just some special considerations uh, for patients that are diagnosed with cancer if you're currently receiving therapy. Uh, my recommendation is to continue receiving treatment as planned unless notified otherwise by your care team. And just honestly have a conversation with your care team about the benefits and risks of continuing treatment, delaying treatment, or reducing treatment. Uh, and this is really, again, you know, on this theme of personalized medicine, I mean, it's really kind of a personalized uh, treatment plan in the middle of a pandemic. If you're currently in surveillance and you're, you're actively not treating your cancer, but you're kind of keeping an eye and making sure that it stays gone, consider postponing the visits until the summer, if at all possible, and obviously consider virtual health visits uh, and Medicare and insurance companies, along with healthcare institutions, have moved incredibly rapidly uh, for this. Uh, the CDC guidelines uh, now recommends using a mask in public. Uh, just remember that not all patients with cancer are severely immunocompromised. If you've received your treatment in the past and haven't received treatment for several months, you're very likely not to be immunocompromised. And uh, keep in mind that many healthcare institutions are postponing elective or non-critical procedures, and this unfortunately includes screening colonoscopies, but obviously includes elective surgeries and procedures, and sometimes non-urgent CT and MRI scans. What I believe that you will see over the next couple of weeks uh, to months is an opening up of elective and non-critical procedures. Uh, and I think hospitals are obviously very anxious to get these things going because they are important, even if they're not critical to get in the next 24 hours. What about clinical trials? Uh, patients currently enrolled on the clinical trials will most likely continue as planned, uh, mainly because if you're on a clinical trial and you're doing well with it, uh, they're, they're, the risk of stopping uh, simply far, uh, far outweighs uh, uh, or the benefit far outweighs the risk. Um, and in, if patients are seeking to enroll into clinical trials, they may experience some delays in clinical trial enrollment, and it just depends on the clinical situation. Uh, but just keep in mind that clinical trials uh, access may be a little bit down uh, compared to before, um, but we, again, expect this to improve over the next couple of months as well. In terms of treating COVID-19, Boy, lots of headlines, uh, lots of drugs under investigation. Uh, hydroxychloroquine made the headlines. Uh, remdesivir, there may be some promising data uh, coming out of there. Here, I would tell you, don't take any of these unless you're, uh, you know, obviously either critically ill in the ICU uh, or um, uh, if you're uh, uh, in, in a clinical trial. Uh, convalescent plasma is a very interesting uh, kind of uh, topic or, or idea where you're taking plasma from patients that have had a diagnosis of COVID-19 and recovered and then injecting that into critically ill patients. And so many uh, academic institutions currently have these protocols up and running. 
Uh, certainly a lot of good news, though. We live in the Internet age, and so un fortunately or unfortunately, we're all a heck of a lot better at Zoom. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting. Telehealth and virtual visits are, are, are things that we have talked about for many, many years. Uh, we have been pushed into 21st century medicine very, very quickly, uh, and it was amazing to see how rapidly telehealth and virtual visits uh, came about. Uh, if you think about how we would have done even just five, ten years ago uh, when we didn't have widely available grocery and medication delivery, uh, I think we're very lucky to have a lot of the uh, things in place that we do right now. Uh, I want to encourage everybody to say that we are flattening the curve. Now is not the time uh, to necessarily, uh, you know, uh, take, uh, you know, take your foot off the brakes. Uh, I would say in, in this situation, I mean, we want to make sure that we not only flatten the curve but make that curve go down. Uh, and we should see that over the next couple of weeks as well, uh, presuming that we don't open things up too quickly. Uh, testing capacity is increasing and certainly becoming more efficient. And then I will say that uh, we should see gradual decreasing of current restrictions uh, in the coming weeks to months. So just remember uh, that there, there, the psychological uh, and economic impact of this is significant. Uh, so there are resources available. Fight CRC also has great resources on their website as well. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll wrap up and uh, happy to take any questions that you guys may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. Um, great presentation. I know a lot of um, uh, updates, so, um, so thank you so much. Um, we do have a number of questions that have come in. Um, I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Um, okay, so questions, let's see. Um, all right, so question number one. So I've heard a lot about somatic testing and germline testing. Do those terms coincide with biomarker testing and genetic testing? Yeah, uh, so thanks for that question. So uh, correct, uh, exactly. So if you hear the term somatic testing, a lot of times uh, they're gonna be talking about uh, testing of the tumor, uh, looking for what we call somatic mutations within the tumor. So that's exactly what we would consider biomarker testing. That's somatic testing, biomarker testing can help us um, direct treatment plans uh, for our patients. Genetic testing uh, or, or germline testing uh, are kind of synonymous for the, the DNA that we inherit from our parents. Um, sometimes this actually does help us with treatment, right? Um, but for the most part, it does tell us a little bit more about our genetic makeup, what we, might, what we have received from our parents, what we might pass down to our kids. Uh, for colorectal cancer, the most important thing that we look for there is most often Lynch syndrome. If you have Lynch syndrome, your tumor uh, you've inherited basically a broken spell checker down from your parents. Uh, and the risk is that you could then pass along a broken DNA spell checker onto your children. And that's why that's so important because we increase surveillance. Um, uh, the good news of actually Lynch syndrome is that you're, you're, you definitely have an MSI high tumor, which, it, which means that immunotherapy may be um, uh, an appropriate treatment choice uh, in that situation. But, uh, but again, great question and, and important to make that distinction between somatic or biomarker testing and then genetic testing or germline testing. Thank you. Um, our second question, um, does, does CMS reimburse for NGS testing? Yeah, so I would tell you that uh, I think there's a lot of headway that's made that's been made uh, in this arena. Uh, Foundation Medicine uh, has a, uh, an approved uh, panel uh, looking for um, almost you know close to 400 genes, uh, including a lot of these fusions that we that we're talking about as well. Um, I will tell you that I'm not as worried about coverage for these tests as much as I'm worried about the general um, uh, prevalence of testing. Uh, you know, the data that's out there really probably uh, underestimates how much testing is actually going on in our country. But when you look at some of the data, you know, the, the series that are coming out show that maybe biomarker testing is performed in about half uh, to 60% of patients uh, that are diagnosed with metastatic colorectal cancer. I personally think that that number is probably higher um, just the way these studies are run, but it does suggest that there's a good proportion of our patients with metastatic colorectal cancer that are not getting appropriate biomarker testing. Uh, and so just this is you know, part of the reason why in this presentation, you know, I, I'm encouraging everybody just to ask their doctor if um, their tumor has been tested and if not, why it hasn't been, uh, just because it's always good to have that information. It, it, it's extraordinarily unlikely that your physician is missing something, but it's always good to kind of get those questions out in the open air. Yeah, thank you. That's a great point. Um, if you go to the Fight CRC Biomarked uh, website landing page, 
We also have a like a conversation starter if folks uh, want to download that to take to your doctor to help initiate those discussions. Um, yeah, we definitely agree ask, to ask your care team um, about your, you know, whether or not you've had any biomarker testing done. Um, some follow up questions here. Um, okay, this one's kind of long. Give me a moment. Um, I've heard patients comment that first line chemo doesn't work for a lot of people. Can you please elaborate on this um, in regards to stage four patients? As I understand, the differences in tumors with respect to biomarkers become important as tumors become resilient, resistant to first line chemo. Yeah, I, uh, you know, thank, thank you for that question as well. Um, you know, frontline therapy for colorectal cancer, the data does suggest that, you know, majority of our patients will uh, still have a response to therapy. And, you know, what does that mean? Technically, in clinical trials, that means that tumors have shrunk by 30% or more. Um, but, you know, that number is, is not high enough, right? So even if we say that the response rate is 55 to 65%, depending on what frontline regimen that you use, you know, that means that there's such a huge percentage of patients still, you know, 35 to 45% of patients uh, where the tumors are either staying the same and not shrinking or they're actually growing on frontline therapy. Um, I would say the, when is the best time to get biomarker testing? You know, obviously at the time of diagnosis because it can kind of help you map out uh, what potential treatments that you have. Uh, like I said, in a couple months, we may no longer be offering chemotherapy in a frontline setting for patients that have MSI high colorectal cancer. Maybe we should be offering them immunotherapy, but uh, we'll find out more when that data is released in about a month or two. Um, so really, uh, you know, the, the biomarker testing is important to get done in any line of therapy. I would say for frontline therapy, I think the comment is, is correct in the sense that, yeah, we need better frontline options. Uh, for sure in their clinical trials trying to answer that question right now. Thank you. And Dr. Liu, what is your definition of NED? Is it the same as remission? Yeah, so, you know, th there are a lot of these terms uh, that are kind of thrown around and, and you can kind of more or less equ equate them to, this, to the same, uh, same thing. Uh, you know, sometimes my patients that have had, you know, stage one, stage two, stage three, or even if they've had stage four, uh, colorectal cancer, but they don't have any disease that's visible uh, on a radiologic exam, like a CT scan or an MRI, uh, they kind of ask me, you know, what, what should we say? <laughs> you know, what, what do we tell our family members when they say, well, do you, are you in remission? Do you have colorectal cancer? Uh, so, you know, I, a lot of times in that situation, I just tell my patients, listen, you know, you let them know, you know, sure, I had stage three colorectal cancer. Uh, I currently have no evidence of disease. You know, what does that mean? Well, we can't see anything. Uh, and, and, and that's obviously a very, very good thing. Now, kind of looping back and talking about circulating tumor DNA, well, maybe, you know, we can better define what no evidence of the C's means, right? So what if we take a blood sample and we don't detect any circulating tumor DNA? Well, now you don't have any evidence of disease on a CT scan and you can't detect any circulating tumor DNA, you know, in your bloodstream. Uh, I, I've just kind of a, a word of caution about liquid biopsies. I mean, right, right now, uh, it's hard to know how to clinically apply these tests. I think we will know a lot, lot more in the coming years about how best to use them. Um, but uh, just kind of giving you an idea of what we're trying to do in the future is maybe get better than just CT scans. Thank you. Um, we have a, a couple more questions that have come through, uh, actually a few questions on this same topic. So people are asking about uh, biomarker testing being done more than once. Um, should this happen? And if so, at what point um, should biomarker testing be, uh, be done again? Yeah, so, so great question. And the answer really is uh, nobody knows the answer to this question. Uh, I'll give you a clinical scenario. Uh, that, that might help, that probably has uh, maybe the most evidence around us. And, and so, it, you know, we had talked about uh, RAS mutations. So the two genes that we look at are KRAS and NRAS, K-R-A-S and N-R-A-S. Uh, sometimes when patients are de deemed to be RAS wild type, so we had talked about this before, you know, no evidence of a mutation, we give those patients drugs like cetuximab and panitumumab, those are drugs that target epidermal growth factor receptor because we believe that, well, there'll be a, a good response to those drugs. So um, when we give those patients these inhibitors, there are times when you can actually test circulating tumor DNA where you can start to detect RAS mutations. 
and, and that's very, very interesting because what it suggests is that you're killing off all the cells in your body that don't have the mutation, and all you're left with are the cells in your body that actually do have the mutation, suggesting that the tumor itself is very, very kind of varied and mixed and heterogeneous uh, than we ever kind of previously thought, that maybe we're kind of stripping away one set of cells, but we're allowing another set of cells to kind of grow. And so, you know, there have been studies to show that, well, when you take the pressure off the tumor, so you stop those drugs, those mutations in the bloodstream disappear, which means that, well, maybe you're kind of getting those wild-type cells back. Uh, and so there's this idea kind of percolating through the colorectal cancer community of, well, maybe we can re-challenge uh, these particular patients when their mutations, you know, go away, that you can actually re-challenge them with these drugs, atuximab and panitumumab. There's some clinical trials that are kind of being designed uh, to help answer that question, but that's probably, you know, the best example I can kind of give you in terms of how we might use this technology in the future, and there's some data uh, around that. But in terms of um, being able to say, well, this is definitely what your physician should do or anything like that, I'm not saying that at all. A lot of this is very experimental, and it's just kind of what we call hypothesis generating, which means it's just, you know, we're kind of getting ideas, but these, this really does need to be proven in clinical practice before we can say, you know, for certainty, this is what we should be doing and how, how we should be using these tests. Thank you. Um, another question here, any correlation regarding the impact of biomarker detection during screening for colorectal cancer and the impact on therapy for those, pat those patients who uh, turn out to be CRC positive? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that uh, in, the, in the coming uh, months to years, you're going to see more and more clinical trials looking at these blood tests probably being done in conjunction with colonoscopies and trying to correlate, you know, do patients when they're newly diagnosed with a stage one, stage two, or stage three colorectal cancer, what does their ctDNA look like? And, and really the, the question largely being, you know, is there, you know, could you imagine a time where we could use these liquid biopsies uh, as a screening test for cancer? And, and the answer right now is definitely no. Um, but I think, th you know, over the next couple of years, you're going to see more and more data of, you know, can we detect colorectal cancer earlier uh, just by getting a blood test? Can we detect it, uh, you know, as it turns from a polyp into a tumor? Uh, that would be incredibly powerful, right? Because um, not only could you uh, you, you know, find these cancers, but you might be able to detect them at an earlier stage where the cure rates are, are so much higher. So, uh, so I would say, you know, stay tuned, um, but uh, you're going to see more and more of this come out in the future. Sorry about that. I, I muted myself, but I was, <laughs> I was thanking you okay. Dr. Lou, uh, for the time today. And um, it was a great presentation. Um, and thank you to everyone who was able to join live. As a reminder, the, the recording of the session will be directly emailed to you tomorrow, um, or you can check back the Fight CRC website um, later today. Um, and again, thanks for joining Dr. Liu. Huge thank you for all of the updates. We really appreciate you and your time and um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you guys. Please stay safe. Thanks.